the Healing Through Love podcast with Charlene Lynch and Rose Davidson. In episode 119, explore sustainable health with Tracy Desjardins as she debunks diet culture and guides you through five steps to peace with food. And I love having those conversations. I do a lot of work with women based on a place that I've healed from uh, around, around unwanted emotional eating concerns. So is there a way that we can love food, enjoy food, find pleasure in food without it being a problem? I say hands down, yes. But I believe that conversations like that don't happen enough. So on my website, theholisticdivas.com, everyone diving in can find the link to my book, The Diet Free Diva. And there's also a link that says freebies, and I have some powerful free resources. I developed um, something that helped me, and I'm so proud of this, and I worked so hard on this, my emotional eating rescue meditation. So anyone like me who has found themselves in the past using food to soothe, comfort, numb, escape, find love, all things, and really feel trapped in that, I created something where you can just download it to your device for free, put your headphones on, and I can help help you walk through the steps that I coach my clients through. The Healing Through Love podcast with Charlene Lynch and Rose Davidson. Welcome to another episode of Healing Through Love. Each week, we share ideas, experiences and resources to increase the awareness of domestic and family violence and to empower survivors to grow and thrive. We talk with experts who share their advice or with people who have experienced abuse, no matter where they are on their journey. This is all about healing through love. And now, here are your hosts, Charlene Lynch and Rose Davidson. Hello and welcome to the Healing Through Love podcast, a space where stories of strength, resilience and transformation unfold. I'm your host, Charlene Lynch, and I'm honoured to be your guide on this journey of empowerment and healing. Today, we have a very special episode tailored just for you, whether you're driving or sipping a cup of tea or hot chocolate, in my case today, or simply taking a moment for yourself. I want you to know that you're in a safe place. Healing Through Love is more than a podcast. It's a community, a beacon of hope and a reminder that you're not alone. In this episode, we have a guest who will share a story that will resonate with the core of our mission a story that illuminates the power of love, resilience and unwavering strength that lies within each of us. So settle in and take a deep breath and let the healing begin. But before we begin with today's narrative, um, just a quick reminder that if you find value in our episodes, consider supporting us by subscribing, sharing and leaving a review. Your engagement helps us reach the hearts and spread the message of healing through love to a broader audience. Now, we've got a beautiful guest here today, Tracy Desjardins. I don't know. I hope I got that name right. It's French Canadian. Very challenging. Uh, She is a national board certified health and wellness coach and a mind body eating coach and a fitness professional. Amongst other things, she has written a book called Diet Free Diva, which I'm planning to dive into. And Tracy specializes in helping women find solutions for unwanted (laughs) eating concerns, such as restrictive dieting and for weight loss. Uh, Look, uh, let's, this is one of my hot subjects. Let's dive in. How did you get here? Oh my gosh, Charlene, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the Healing Through Love podcast. It's an honor to be here. And that was just a beautiful introduction. So thank you so much. Uh, you know, it's all, it's always so surreal when I, um, when I answer this question, because um, I, sometimes I have to shake myself and, and get real about I'm actually on this live show, you know, talking about something that was so challenging for me, um, for over three decades of my life. So I, um, I got to the place that I'm at, because I've, I've been through quite a bit with, um, let's say uh, the battle with food and body starting at the ginger age of 12. And I I love um, telling my story. I encourage other women, I I speak with men as well, to share their story about what they've been through in their own struggle with food and body. And it's honestly been some of the most fulfilling work that I've done in my life, opening the, the doorway to not just share my own story, but learning that when I share mine, it helps other people feel vulnerable and safe to share theirs. And there is where some powerful healing takes place. I love that. I love that. I love that. Because haven't we all got a story somewhere 
in and around weight. <laughs> um, yeah. And for some people, it's actually um, putting it on and other people, it's the opposite, uh, taking it off. So obviously you've got a personal story. At what, at what point in time did you decide that you were going to make a profession out of this or did you lose the weight first and then um, it became a professional? Yeah. You know, I think the best way to answer that is to kind of start at the beginning and I'll kind of streamline this to give the audience kind of a, a glimpse of my story and um, which will kind of take me into the answer to your question about where I made this, my new line of work. Um, my, my battle with food and body started at age 12. I was a slightly overweight child growing up in this, in the seventies and eighties. And um, I reached a point, well, up until the age of 12, I was perfectly fine with who I was, what I looked like. I didn't really have an issue with food. I really liked to eat, but to me, it didn't seem like a problem until around the age of 12. And I hear this from so many other people right around that age is where a problem began. I find it fascinating. And as soon as I caught on to what society admired, all of a sudden, it was like a, a switch flipped. And I believe that I had to learn to suffer through feeling hungry, eating things I didn't really like, and forcing some sort of war path with food to change how I looked, to go from being what I felt was normal and healthy and thriving into um, being very thin because that was what was deemed lovable, admirable, successful, and I wasn't that. <laughs> so I needed to get there or something bad was going to happen to me. Wow. And um, so that's that began a th three plus decade long up and down game of shoots and ladders and ping pong with restrictive diet, feel something off um, rebel against the rules. I couldn't put that into words back then, but that's what was happening. And then I would binge on what was forbidden, which to me was always sweets. It was always the, the really forbidden stuff that I had labeled or learned. I inherited a belief system about the, the, the sweets that I loved. So I really, I, I developed a problem with sugar back then that didn't exist before. And I, Nobody really talked about this. You know, I didn't have one of those classic eating disorders, but I, I kind of did, you know, but nobody talked about those of us that were trying to lose weight with some sort of restrictive plan and then binging in private and starting over again. Um, nobody really talked about those of us that were doing that. And so we tend to develop a level of embarrassment or secrecy or shame that can just drain us from self-esteem and self-confidence. I went from a kid who was living life in abundance, liked who I was, made friends to somebody who was very insecure about not just food and my body, but a lot of other things as well. And I, I used a lot of, um, let's say, compensatory things to kind of make up for that, like excessive exercise to make up for binges. And I spent a lot of my life energy recovering from my binges and starting over. And it was always, I was going to start over on Monday. And I knew in my heart and in my soul that there was something off. I just didn't know where to go. And I didn't know who to talk about, about this, because I thought that I was the only one that really had that kind of problem. So I kept trying to do my own kept trying to like dig a new hole and try to find new solutions. And I got really tired of that. So to answer your question, Charlene, as I trudged through the decades, college, getting married, having children, in the background was always the consumption, the mental consumption of, I got to lose this weight. It was always like 10, 20 pounds. Things never got really out of hand for me, but I felt like they were. I really had a problem that, and that I didn't know where to go for help. I just kept thinking I'm going to start over trying harder the next time. So I finally, as I got older, I'm 54 right now. I, as I got older, my body started to send me signs like, hey, we're tired of this. We're tired of this. So it took me longer to recover from my abusing food. It took me longer to make up for the damage that I felt. I literally would feel hungover from what I was doing with sugar, with food to compensate for what was really bothering me. 
And um, I started to take notice. I started studying. I became a health coach. I I thought, well, I want to help other people with this problem, but I don't really know what I'm doing either, but I'm going to figure it out. You know, a lot of other people that get into my line of work come from that reference. And it can be very empowering because we do learn a lot about ourselves. So I, I would like to say that at the beginning of pandemic, which yeah. was 2020, 2020, at the time, I, I owned my own personal training business and I was exhausted. I was exhausted. And just like everyone else, I had to shut my business down and go home, stock up on our toilet paper and just stay home. And in that time period is when I was forced to slow down and be, and that's when I really felt a calling. I really kind of felt like God was like, okay, Tracy, you can keep doing things your way, or maybe you can spend some time with me now because I can help you if you're willing to listen. Yeah. So I started to do things a little differently. And for the first time ever, I, um, my work in fitness, you know, I had this, this, this ego where I should know, I should have the solutions to this after all these years. And I really believed the shoulding and I didn't, I was really stuck on some things. So I hired my own coach, got some therapy through what was prompting me to use food to numb and soothe and escape and to manage that was really holding me back forever. I was exhausted. And when I discovered that the inner work and getting to know myself at a deep level and doing a lot of inner forgiveness and looking at my story with loving eyes and loving thoughts, I discovered this is what is taking me through this. And I haven't binged. I haven't abused food since then. And the biggest thing is opening up this doorway for other women to come for you. I work with women, but my, I help my husband too. And he said, <laughs> you know, your book, the book that you wrote speaks to men too, even though it's hot pink. So during pandemic and during my own therapy and my own healing, I had to write. So I started to write and I wrote the Diet Free Diva. And in it, I share five healing steps for finding peace and freedom with food without restrictive dieting mm -hmm. and without relying on some other diet plan to take us to the, the promised land where life is going to be great, because as we know, that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of some tidbits to my story as to where I landed in the work that I do now. Oh, I love it. I love it. I have, as you said, uh, since the age of 12, similarly, I, I, I wonder whether or not it's got something to do with the onset of the hormones because that's oh, around yeah. the same time that I got my period. And I think also I became a little bit more body aware. So like I was always very athletic and then all that, then all of a sudden I'm like, hmm, am I athletic or, you know, am I round? I like, you know, is there a distinction here? So I really understand what you're saying there. And uh, as a survivor of domestic and family violence, I noticed that when I would go through phases of, you know, attempting to uh, rectify the situation and move through and become better, I would lean heavily back on food because I love food. If you just have a look at my Facebook feed, you'll just see a lot of food. And, um, and I, I, yeah, emotional eating on every level. Uh, and not having that understanding of how to care for my body. I'm 57, so I get it. I get the age thing. And uh, and we need to approach food differently at 57 than we do when we are 17. Our metabolism is different. And um, I don't know. I also think somehow, Tracy, it's an energetic thing as well, that food is love, <laughs> <laughs> and that if we can see food as love, we don't necessarily need to eat it just to actually get more love. That uh, for me, making food for other people is still the same. I'm still sharing love because I'm making it and giving it to other people. Yeah. So uh, I love this. This is fascinating. Now, you've got some freebies that you're offering for the clients today. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, and the main freebie that I want to share that that really uh, attaches to what you just said, and I really love what, what you just described about, you know, food can be love and it can, I actually help women embrace that concept from a place that nurtures them, um, not keeps them stuck in abusing food. And I love having those conversations. I do a lot of work with women based on a place that I've healed from uh, around, around unwanted emotional eating concerns. So is there a way that we can love food, enjoy food, find pleasure in food without it being a problem? I say hands down, yes. But I believe that conversations like that don't happen enough. So on my website, theholisticdivas.com, everyone diving in can find the link to my book, The Diet-Free Diva. There's also a link to book a free call with me where you 
you can share your story with me and I can hold private space with you, which is where the, the real fun work begins and the empowerment starts. And there's also a link that says freebies. And I have some powerful free resources. I developed um, something that helped me and I'm so proud of this. And I worked so hard on this, my emotional eating rescue meditation. So anyone like me who has found themselves in the past using food to soothe, comfort, numb, escape, find love, all things, and really feel trapped in that. I created something where you can just download it to your device for free, put your headphones on, and I can help help you walk through the steps that I coach my clients through. Not enough time for us to go through that uh, today, but all of that can be found on my website, theholisticdivas.com. Oh, I love that. And the link's going to be in the bio and also in the show description. I love it. I must say, having a better relationship with food for me has also meant understanding how to grow it as well. So we do hydroponics, which means we get really fresh uh, microgreens like every day. And I always find a way to get them into the food. I don't know, even if it's just sprinkled on top. And uh, and on our patio, we grow at the moment because it's winter here in Australia. I'm growing beetroot and, uh, and quite a lot of herbs and whatnot. In summer, we grow a lot of tomatoes and basil and also sprouting. So just like Learning to love food on a different level where you're a part of the process of it evolving and growing, I don't know. For me, it's made a huge difference in understanding food and just appreciating uh, better quality but less food. Because uh, in Australia, we like big servings, just saying. In the USA, we do too, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's so you know, it's just switching to a smaller plate. It was quite dramatic for me. And yet it was really beneficial, interestingly enough, um, to actually switch to a smaller plate. And if I'm going to be a little bit on the naughty side, I've got a blue plate. And the blue plate, because the psychology behind blue is we're less likely to want to eat something blue, is that I won't eat as much. So just by switching my plate to a blue plate, I will be a better consumer on that occasion. And I'll do that if it's something I really love because I love lasagna. <laughs> You know what I love about that, Charlene, is that is something that is unique to you that you discovered, that works for you, that makes you feel good, that helps you thrive. It's a solution for you, and that's unique to you. Things like that, um, I help my clients discover for them because they also have their own unique things that resonate with them that can help heal a damaged relationship with food right down to the color of the plate. Yeah. And this is where like departing from the, the, the diet industry where they tell you what to do and you, you don't trust yourself, you trust them. And it's always short-lived and it always ends bad. Um, these conversations about doing small things and noticing how you feel when you do them is what I call the path of excellence that, that someone can build for themselves that provides something sustainable right down to your blue plate and the hydroponics and growing your tomatoes. I do similar things. And that is what really just hits the spot and feels like, you know, I can do this today. And a year from now, I, I envision myself doing the same thing because it just feels right for me. Yeah, I love it. We also embarked on, uh, since 2018, we've been doing intermittent fasting. And that's because for us, and it's not about, you know, keto or any of those sorts of things. It's more about, I don't know, honoring the space for my body to do the thing that it needs to do. And I just noticed the older I get, the more time I need to give my body to do the things that it needs to do. And by not eating in the morning and just uh, you know, drinking lemon water and just uh, herbal teas and all those sorts of things. I don't know. It's made a huge difference to time, number one, for me, but also just, um, I don't know, I get the best meditation and prayer in the morning. I get better in the morning than I do in the evening. And I think it's because my body's not busy doing other things. I'm just in that state of elimination. And, um, and also just time-wise, I've noticed that because we've got very busy lives, that without having to do the whole sit down, have breakfast thing, that it just has freed me up time-wise as well. And I understand that it's like an ancient technology they've been doing like for a very long time. So I'm going to go, it works for me, but it doesn't necessarily work for everybody. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, I personally have not had a good experience with intermittent fasting coming from a place of binge eating disorder. Mm -hmm. However, however, I agree with you. I just, actually, it's 7.24 a.m., 
Eastern Standard Time, and it's the evening for you. So I just finished with my prayer and meditation, and I have my lemon water sitting right here next to me. And my body says, you know, Tracy, we don't need the breakfast that we needed before. We're really not hungry until later in the morning. So I honor that. I don't call it intermittent fasting because that kind of gets in my head. But what you're saying works for you and what works for me is something that I help women discover mm. for them. Oh, it's, it's eight o'clock. I need to eat. Well, are you hungry? Yeah. So let's be a little more intuitive. What are you noticing? What are you feeling? Let's honor your own innate um, hunger and appetite wisdom and because there's something there. So true. It's about that level of awareness too. And I think that um, for such a long time, I, I personally didn't have the level of awareness what was really happening for me. I was just doing it because it was the thing that had to be done. And exactly. uh, and I think that we need more of that. You know, if we're going to take the time to do prayer and meditation and all of these good things to do to keep us in a space of Zen, we need to also consider that food's part of that process as well. Absolutely. We are biologically created to want to eat yeah. because if we don't eat, we know what's going to happen. So trying to find peace and sustainability and, and, and trusted terms is really is really fitting and it's also an unpopular road because <laughs> there's all you mentioned the there's the keto there's this plan there's that plan there's the tv commercials and all of that it's very very confusing and i uh, just encourage everyone to um take a little tidbit of what you and i are sharing like learning to trust our own inner wisdom takes time it takes patience and it's also the unsexy approach yeah. that is sustainable that does bring peace and freedom and it it hits the spot but it takes time Oh, it's so true. And I like even just good quality water. I noticed that. So we live in Adelaide and when Adelaide's not really known for its best quality water. So, but when I started drinking filtered water, like the difference at the taste, it like it tastes different. So I want to drink more of it. And then I think you drink more and then you become more healthy. So but I think quality water makes a difference. I don't know I don't know the, the science behind it, but I know that I drink more when it's good quality water. And then your body really does like drinking, obviously, more water. I do you want to ask, in your opinion, what is the right amount of water for a person to drink? Because there's so much debate over that. Thank you for asking that. Nobody's ever asked me that in an interview. And I literally just read something about that. I used to be one of those coaches, especially in the fitness industry. You need to drink, you know, eight to 10 glasses plus more if you're fit. Like there was some sort of rule around the water. And lately, what if, if you read something that's really powerful, everybody is uniquely different with the water. I mean, I'm going to share mine. This is this is about 60 ounces or so. And I get through two of these a day, but that's what works for me. For my husband, two of these a day is way too much. Like it's really hard for him to choke down that much water. I have a lemon squeezed in this thing. I have filtered water. So I'm going to say, Charlene, that it is subjective. And uh, a lot of a lot of people say that they don't like water. And I say, let's experiment with it because I want you to notice how you feel when you drink water. But I, I squeeze either an orange or or a lemon or a lime, sometimes a lime in my water. I fill this thing with ice because I like that little extra something. Plus it helps to, to cleanse our insides. But with all of the sugary drinks out there and all of, I was a diet Coke queen forever. Um, there is a pathway where we can learn to love water and it's just so nourishing and, and flushing. It's like a, I don't know, I'd like to call it a power spray to our insides. And sometimes based on what we've learned in society, every, all the sugary things and diet sodas and bubbly this and bubbly that, we can train ourselves back to enjoy good old fashioned oh, in our term. Absolutely. Uh, I replace, well, I don't drink alcohol anymore. So it's all coffee. So it's been a big shift for me. But I, you know, if I'm going to have a naughty drink, it's going to be mineral water or soda water mixed with like lime and made into like a virgin mojita like and mint like so that's yummy 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 and we grow our own mint so like for me that's a naughty drink <laughs> but you know that's really healthy and it's delicious and um you're right there's just too much sugar in a lot of the food and drink that we have and I, I'm not exactly sure about what it is with carbonated drinks but I I don't think they're good for our bodies I think yeah. I think they do damage to our bones. So I notice when I'm not doing everything else, I'm a belly dancer. So we are, we're all, we're called the stars of the Nile, but behind doors, we call ourselves the stars of denial because I'm 57 and I'm the youngest, right? So we go up to 77 Hello. years old and we dance in aged care facilities. That way we're younger 
and that works. But what we notice is the people that have got less of the bone density issues and the, and the bones and leaning over and all the other issues are people that never drank soda pop, they call it. And yeah. the ones that are like this are the ones that drank soda and Coke particularly and those sorts of things. So I think there's a correlation there that um, it somehow damages your bones. I don't know how, but that's what I yeah. think. And I'm sticking. I, I agree. And, you know, I also, I think, well, you heard me reference, I'm the, you know, the diet, former diet Coke queen. It was really difficult to make that transition. Um, I always felt like that carbonation, I know this is not true, but I felt addicted. I needed that zip. I needed that zip of like a fountain soda. So I had to slowly wean myself off of that because I started to get weird headaches, Charlene. Yeah. I started to get, and I, I was kind of like, okay, this is a sign. I was getting weird headaches as soon as I would have my first Diet Coke of the day. And I got a little scared. I was in my forties. Uh, I got a little scared of that. Like, I think this is a sign that I, it's time for me to make that shift. Like I need to recognize this as a problem and do something about it. So I started to wean, just started to wean back. Then I went into unsweetened iced tea with lemon, lots of ice. Now yes. I'm all of that. But I'd like a glass of red wine every now and then. But I do notice because we're talking intuitive, like, how is this affecting me? How am I feeling? It disrupts my sleep. And then when my sleep is disrupted, the next day I don't have as much energy. So is that glass of wine worth it? Most of the time, not. Most of the time, it's not. But like we in our 50s, you know, it's, we're, we're learning to, to recognize that wisdom. And that feels pretty good. Like, how is when I do this affecting me? And am I okay with that? Yes. On every level, I love it. So, um, so there's so much to dive into. It's not just about what we're eating or when we're eating or what we're not eating, but it's also the fluid that we're having as well. And I love the way that you're looking at this, that it's not a cookie cutter approach, that every human on this planet is different. You've got different DNA. You've got different thought processes. You're a different person. And you've also got that different pattern of beliefs as well. So, you know, how is one diet that works for one person going to work for another? Or how is one eating process or whatever technology, whatever you want a fancy word you want to give it, How's it going to work for everybody? And I love the your fresh approach, which is very bespoke. Where are you? What are you, what what works for you? What doesn't work for you? And how can we build a solution for you from where you are? So that I love that, and there needs to be more of that. And I love that you've got these free resources that our audience can dive in. And as I said, the links are going to be in the show notes and also in the show descriptions as well. And uh, and also that fantastic book, which is on Amazon. So that means wherever you are in the world, listeners, you can actually dive in and read that. There wouldn't be too many people listening to us today that wouldn't have had some challenges in and around weight and whether it's putting it on or taking it off. And it not, might not even be you. It might be your partner or your children. So it's great to dive in and have a look at another alternative that doesn't include the diet. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And so you mentioned about sleep. What sort of part has sleep got to play with uh, with our health and our and food? Oh, I love that question, and that certainly applies to men and women. And it, this is this coming in really good timing. My husband and I were both in our fifties, and we have spent some time really analyzing. Like we've had good sleep, we've had bad sleep. Um, most of the time, we have challenged challenged sleep. So we started to identify what is causing this, and um, we have noticed that our level of sleep is correlated to how we're taking care of ourselves. So. It's really interesting the things that we took for granted in our former decades, oh, sleep great. Or like if we didn't, we were okay the next day, those days are over and now sleep is a precious commodity. So we've really started, he's doing certain things differently. He's just been recently diagnosed with sleep apnea. So he's taking the next step, um, cleaning up uh, a lot of his sugary drinks he was drinking, make some, making some nutritional shifts to start to sleep better. So his energy is better. It's really important to him right now. And then I've discovered like wine. If I say yes to wine, I am saying no to quality sleep. So um, I'm kind of weighing what's going on there. And I also notice little things like um, if I fall asleep on the couch, watching our favorite show, and then I wake up and try to go to bed, I can't fall asleep. So connecting the dots with what am I noticing? What are their patterns? What is helping me? And what is bringing a setback with regards to sleep is really where we're at right now. And this, this amazing decade of, of the 50s is really an interesting 
new um, chapter we're, uh, we're finding. I hope I answered your question. No, I do. I love it. I love it. I was just thinking about we've changed our sleep patterns as well. We like to sleep with um, some grey uh, sound in the background, so grey noise, um, mm -hmm. and it's this, it's it's crickets and frogs, right? Because we live on a riverbed, right? And so when the when the uh, the uh, ecosystem outside is really healthy, so when it's raining, we get lots of crickets and lots of frogs, and we sleep really well then. So when it's not raining or um, it, it's really too cold for the frogs to be out, there's no frogs or crickets. So we make our own. Frogs and crickets by listening to frogs and crickets um, on like a podcast. It's like a Spotify list. Anyway, it's working. We love it. And um, so I travel a lot for work and I, I listen to it when I travel and then I think that I'm home. So I even sleep better if I'm sleeping in a hotel. So it's fascinating the things that we can do to like trick our minds into feeling safe and to feeling yeah. that level of comfort so that you can sleep better. But sleep if you don't get it it is a weight issue on every level and it's also a health issue i know when i've had periods of time where i haven't slept as well weight gain and when i'm sleeping well the weight takes care of itself so i think that i think it's got something to do with it i don't show i know the science of it. it's not my area of expertise but i think it has got something to do with it well, I, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because I mentioned my emotional eating rescue meditation. One of the things I learned as I examined my, my story, I call it them. Step one in my book is, is um, discover and write your food story. And part of what I noticed in my own story was when my energy was low, whether I was intentionally sacrificing sleep to get more done with work, you know, I was a busy mom, whatever that was, I was most of the time using food, filling up on sugar, I was rebelling from my diet, but at the same time, I was also trying to fill up on energy to keep going to ignoring uh, my body's needs for sleep because I believed I needed to get more done at work, at home to be successful because that's what people do. They just push their limits, which causes problems. Um, I was using food to fill up on energy when what I needed was more sleep mm. a long time. And I, I really, I think I kind of knew that, but didn't want to believe it because I was afraid that I was going to get behind on life. So and we another, another bonus for getting quality sleep is when we're too tired, we are very vulnerable to grab that brownie, order that pizza, because we, you know, we don't want to cook dinner or whatever that might be. And or those are just like all kinds of signals. Yeah. Yeah. I've done that too. <laughs> I love it. I love it. This is so good. I love everything that you've got to say here. And uh, and your uh, your free offers today are amazing and the audience can lean in and have a closer look at that. And uh, and the book's available and you know, it's it's a quick read really, isn't it? It is a quick read. I don't even I forgot. It's 184 pages, five steps to finding peace and freedom with food on one, on your own trusted and sustainable terms. I walk you through the five steps. So you're basically designing your own path of excellence. With, there's only I, I don't give you a meal plan. I don't tell you what to eat. I help you decide. Mm -hmm. And there, my, my book tells my story. It also opens the door for others to consider their story. And a lot of the mindset and the, the wisdom and the little things that the diet industry doesn't teach us are in my book to help you explore your thoughts. I love so, it. This wow. is such a unique twist because it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And here you are, Tracy, telling us that we have the answers, that we have got this, the answers are inside, and that you just need to lean in to knowing yourself on a different level and understanding what's a good match for you, where you are, the age you are, and the, the place in your journey. I love this. This is such great work. Ah, oh, uh, look, in closing today, because we could talk all day, I feel, Tracy, <laughs> that uh, in closing today, I'd love you to share your words of wisdom with our audience. Oh, thank you so much, Charlene. This has just been such a delightful interview, by the way. I just want to say thank you. Uh, I think the word of wisdom that I'd like to share, I want to keep it super simple. Everyone has a story. You have a story and every attempt at weight loss or attempt to figure the food out or whatever, we learned something. There are clues and details about the takeaways. And a lot of us want to shut that out. And what it was, it was, you know, that was a horrible experience. Your story is very valid. It's very powerful. And by just sharing your story with someone like me who has her own story can be step one for you to discover 
what's just waiting to help you. So everyone listening in, you have a very powerful story. And sometimes finding someone that you can trust in safe space to share can take you down that road of empowerment. Oh, I love it. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Tracy, for sharing that with us today. That's a goodbye from me and a goodbye from Tracy. Bye for now. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Healing Through Love. You can get further resources, see the show notes, or simply reach out to us via our website at htlaustralia.org. Thanks so much for joining us, and we look forward to your company next time on the Healing Through Love podcast. Oh,